Chapter Forty Four of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford. Chapter Forty Four. Love took up the harp of life and smote on all the chords with might smote the chord of self that trembling passed in music out of sight lady swansdown is startled into a remembrance of the present by the entrance of somebody after all dicky the troublesome was right this is no spot in which to sleep or dream turning her head with an indolent impatience to see who has come to disturb her she meets lady baltimore's clear eyes some sharp pang of remorse of fear perhaps compels her to spring to her feet and gaze at her hostess with an expression that is almost defiant dicky's words had so far taken effect that she now dreads and hates to meet the woman who once had been her staunch friend lady baltimore unable to ignore the look in her rival's eyes still advances toward her with unfaltering step perhaps a touch of disdain of contempt is perceptible in her own gaze because lady swansdown paling moves toward her she seems to have lost all self-control she is trembling violently it is a crisis what is it says lady swansdown harshly why do you look at me like that has it come to a close between us isabel oh if so vehemently it is better so i don't think i understand you says lady baltimore who has grown very white her tone is haughty she has drawn back a little as if to escape from contact with the other ah that is so like you says lady swansdown with a rather fierce little laugh you pretend 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 from morning till night you entrench yourself behind your pride and you know what you are doing beatrice says lady baltimore ignoring this outburst completely and speaking in a calm level tone yet with a face like marble yes and you know too says lady swanston then with an overwhelming vehemence why don't you do something why don't you assert yourself i shall never assert myself says lady baltimore slowly you mean that whatever comes you will not interfere that exactly turning her eyes full on to the other's face with terrible disdain i shall never interfere in this or any other of his flirtations it is a sharp stab lady swanston winces visibly what a woman you are cries she have you ever thought of it isabel you are unjust to him unfair you passionately treat him as though he were the dust beneath your feet and yet you expect him to remain immaculate for your sake pure as any acolyte a thing of ice no coldly you mistake me i know too much of him to expect perfection nay common decency from him but you it was you whom i hope to find immaculate you expected too much then one iceberg in your midst is enough and that you have kindly suggested in your own person put me out of the discussion altogether ah i you have made that impossible i cannot do that i have known you too long i have liked you too well i have with a swift but terrible glance at her loved you isabel no no not a word it is too late now true says lady swansdown bringing back the arms she had extended and letting them fall into a sudden 
dull vehemence to her sides her agitation is uncontrolled that was so long ago that no doubt you have forgotten all about it you bitterly have forgotten a good deal and you says lady baltimore very calmly what have you not forgotten your self-respect deliberately among other things take care take care says lady swanston in a low tone she has turned furiously upon her why should i take care she throws up her small bead scornfully have i said one word too much too much indeed says lady swanston distinctively but faintly she turns her head but not her eyes in isabel's direction i am afraid you will have to endure for one day longer she says in a low voice after that you shall bid me a farewell that shall last for ever you have come to a wise decision says lady baltimore immovably there is something so contemptuous in her whole bearing that it maddens the other how dare you speak to me like that cries she with sudden violence not to be repressed you of all others do you think you are not in fault at all that you stand blameless before the world the blood has flamed into her pale cheeks her eyes are on fire she advances towards lady baltimore with such a passion of angry despair in look and tone that involuntarily the latter retreats before her who shall blame me demands lady baltimore hotly i i for one icicle that you are how can you know what love means you have no heart to feel no longing to forgive and what has he done to you nothing nothing that any other woman would not gladly condone you are a partisan says lady baltimore coldly you would plead his cause and to me you are violent but that does not put you in the right what do you know of baltimore that i do not know by what right do you defend him there is such a thing as friendship is there says the other with deep meaning is there beatrice oh think think a little bitter smile curls the corners of her lips that you should advocate the cause of friendship to me says she her words falling with cruel scorn one by one slowly from her lips you think me false says lady swanston she is terribly agitated there was an old friendship between us i know that i feel it you think me altogether false to it i think of you as little as i can help says isabel contemptuously why should i waste a thought on you true indeed one so capable of controlling her emotions as you are need never give way to superfluous or useless thoughts still give one to baltimore it is our last conversation together therefore bear with me hear me all his sins lie in the past he you must be mad to talk to me like this interrupts isabel flushing crimson has he asked you to intercede for him could even he go so far as that is it a last insult what are you to him that you thus adopt his cause answer me cries she imperiously all her coldness her stern determination to suppress herself seems broken up nothing returns lady swanston becoming calmer as she notes the other's growing vehemence. i never shall be anything i have but one excuse for my interference she pauses and that i love him steadily but faintly her eyes have sought the ground ah says lady baltimore it is true slowly it is equally true that he does not love me let me then speak all his sins believe me lie behind him that woman that friend of yours who told you of his re 
nude acquaintance with madame istre lied to you there was no truth in what she said i can quite understand your not wishing to believe in that story says lady baltimore with an undisguised sneer like all good women you can take pleasure in inflicting a wound says lady swansdown controlling herself admirably but do not let your detestation of me blind you to the fact that my words contain truth if you will listen i can not a word says lady baltimore making a movement with her hands as if to efface the other i will have none of your confidences it seems to me quickly you are determined not to believe you are at liberty to think as you will the time may come says lady swanston when you will regret you did not listen to me to-day is that a threat no but i am going there will be no further opportunity for you to hear me you must pardon me if i say that i am glad of that says lady baltimore her lips very white i could have borne little more do what you will go where you will with whom you will with deliberate insult but at least spare me a repetition of such a scene as this she turns and with indescribably haughty gesture leaves the room end of chapter 44 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc Chapter number forty five of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter forty five. The name of the slough was despond. Dancing is going on in the small drawing room. A few night broghams are still arriving, and young girls, accompanied by their brothers only, are making the room look lovely. It is quite an impromptu affair, quite informal. Dicky Brown, altogether in his element, is flitting from flower to flower saying beautiful nothings to any of the girls who are kind enough or silly enough to waste a moment on so irreclaimable a butterfly he is not so entirely engrossed by his pleasing occupations however as to be lost to the more serious matters that are going on around him he is specially struck by the fact that lady swansdown who had been in charming spirits all through the afternoon and afterward at dinner is now dancing a great deal with beauclerk of all people and making herself apparently very delightful to him his own personal belief up to this had been that she detested beauclerk and now to see her smiling upon him and favoring him with waltz after waltz upset Dicky's power of penetration to an almost fatal extent. I wonder what the deuce she is up to now, says he to himself, leaning against the wall behind him, and giving voice unconsciously to the thoughts within him. Eh? says somebody in his ear. He looks round hastily to find Miss Maliphant has come to anchor on his left and that her eyes, too, are directed on Beauclerk, who, with Lady Swansdown, is standing at the lower end of the room. A to you, says he brilliantly. I always rather fancied that Mr. Beauclerk and Lady Swansdown were antipathetic, says Miss Maliphant, in her usual heavy, downright way. There was room for it, says Mr. Brown gloomily for it your fancy yes so i think lady swansdown has 
always seemed to me to be rather rayer a eh? decidedly so agrees mr brown as for beauclerk he is quite too dreadfully rather don't you think i don't know i am sure he has often seemed to me a little light but only on the surface you've read him says mr brown with a confidential nod light on the surface but deep deep as a draw well i don't think i mean what you do says miss maliphant quickly however we are not discussing mr beauclerk beyond the fact that we wonder to see him so genial with lady swansdown they used to be thoroughly antagonistic and now why they seem quite good friends don't they quite thick eh with her usual graceful phraseology thick as thieves in valambrosia says mr brown with increasing gloom miss maliphant turns to regard him doubtfully leaves suggests she thieves persists he immovably ah oh ah it's a joke perhaps says she the doubt growing mr brown fixes a stern eye upon her is thy servant a dog says he and stalks indignantly away leaving miss maliphant in the throes of uncertainty yet i am sure it wasn't the right word says she to herself with a wonderful frown of perplexity however i may be wrong often i am and after all spain we're told is full of em whether thieves or leaves she doesn't explain and presently her mind wanders entirely away from mr brown's moddering to the subject that so much more nearly interests her beauclerk has not been quite so impressé in his manner to her to-night not so altogether delightful he has indeed it seems to her shirked her society a good deal and has not been so assiduous about the scribbling of his name upon her card as usual and then this sudden friendship with lady swansdown what does he mean by that what does she mean if she had only known if the answer to her latter question had been given to her her mind would have grown easier and the idea of lady swansdown in the form of a rival would have been laid at rest for ever as a fact lady swansdown hardly understands herself to-night that scene with her hostess has upset her mentally and bodily and created in her a wild desire to get away from herself and from baltimore at any cost some idle freak has induced her to use beauclerk who is detestable to her as a safeguard from both and he unsettled in his own mind and eager to come to conclusions with joyce and her fortune has lent himself to the wiles of his wildom foe and is permitting himself to be charmed by her fascinating if vagrant mood perhaps in all her life lady swanston has never looked so lovely as to-night excitement and mental disturbance have lent a dangerous brilliancy to her eyes a touch of color to her cheek there is something electric about her that touches those who gaze on her and warms herself that a crisis is at hand up to this she has been able to elude all baltimore's attempts at conversation has refused all his demands for dance yet this same knowledge that the night will not go by without a denouement of some kind between her and him is terribly present to her to-night the last night she will ever see him in all human probability the exaltation that enables her to endure this thought is fraught with such agony that brave and determined as she is 
it is almost too much for her yet she isabel she should learn that old friendship between them was no fable to-night it would bear fruit false she believed her well she should see in a way she clung to beauclerk as a means of escaping baltimore throwing out a thousand wiles to charm him to her side and succeeding three times she had given a smiling no to lord baltimore's demand for a dance and regardless of opinion had flung herself into a wild and open flirtation with beauclerk but it is growing toward midnight and her strength is failing her these people will they never go will she never be able to seek her own room and solitude and despair without calling down comment on her head and giving isabel that cold woman the chance of sneering at her weakness a sudden sense of the uselessness of it all has taken possession of her her heart sinks it is at this moment that baltimore once more comes up to her this dance says he it is halfway through you are not engaged i suppose as you are sitting down may i have what remains of it she makes a little gesture of acquiescence and rising places her hand upon his arm end of chapter forty five Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 46 of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 46 O oh, life, thou art a galling load, Along a rough, a weary road, To wretches such as I. The crisis has come, she tells herself, With a rather grim smile, well better have it and get it over that there had been a violent scene between baltimore and his wife after dinner had somehow become known to her and the marks of it still betrayed themselves in the former's frowning brow and somber eyes it had been more of a scene than usual lady baltimore generally so calm had for once lost herself and given way to a passion of indignation that had shaken her to her very heart's core though so apparently unmoved and almost insolent in her demeanour toward lady swanston during their interview she had been nevertheless cruelly wounded by it and could not forgive baltimore in that he had been its cause as for him he could not forgive her all she had said and looked with a heart on fire he had sought lady swanston the one woman who he knew understood and believed in him it was a perilous moment and beatrice knew it she knew too that angry despair was driving him into her arms not honest affection she was strong enough to face this and refuse to deceive herself about it i didn't think you and beauclerk had anything in common said baltimore seating himself beside her on the low lounge that is half hidden from the public gaze by the indian curtains that fall at each side of it he had made no pretense of finishing the dance he had led the way and she had suffered herself to be led into the small anteroom that half smothered in early spring flowers lay off the dancing room ah you see you have yet much to learn about me says she with an attempt at gaiety that fails however about you no 
says he almost defiantly don't tell me i have deceived myself about you beatrice you are all i have left to fall back upon now his tone is reckless to the last degree a forlorn piss aller says she steadily with a forced smile what is it cyril looking at him with sudden intentness something has happened what the old story returns he and i am sick of it i have thrown up my hand i would have been faithful to her beatrice i swear that but she does not care for my devotion and as for me now he throws out his arms as if tired to death and draws in his breath heavily now says she leaning forward am i worth your acceptance says he turning sharply to her i hardly dare to think and yet you have been kind to me and your own lot is not altogether a happy one and he pauses do you hesitate asks she very bitterly although her pale lips are smiling will you risk it all says he sadly will you come away with me i feel i have no friend on earth but you will you take pity on me i shall not stay here whatever happens i have striven against fate too long it has overcome me another land a different life complete forgetfulness do you know what you are saying asked lady swansdon who has grown deadly white yes i have thought it all out it is for you now to decide i have sometimes thought i was not entirely indifferent to you and at all events we are friends in the best sense of the term if you were a happy married woman beatrice i should not speak to you like this but as it is in another land if you will come with me we think think says she putting up her hand to stay him from further speech all this is said in a moment of angry excitement you have called me your friend and truly i am so far in touch with you that i can see you are very unhappy you have had forgive me if i probe you but you have had some some words with your wife final words i hope i think i do not however all this will blow over and come cyril face it are you really prepared to deliberately break the last link that holds you to her there is no link she has cut herself adrift long since she will be glad to be rid of me and you will you be glad to be rid of her it will be better says he shortly and the boy don't let us go into it says he a little wildly oh but we must we must says she the boy you will i shall leave him to her it is all she has i am nothing to her i cannot leave her desolate how you consider her says she in a choking voice she could have burst into tears what a heart and that woman to treat him so whilst oh it is hard hard i tell you says she presently that you have not gone into this thing to-morrow you will regret all that you have now said if you refuse me yes it lies in your hands now are you going to refuse me give me a moment says she faintly she has risen to her feet and is so standing that he cannot watch her her whole soul is convulsed shall she shall she not the scales are trembling that woman's face how it rises before her now pale cold contemptuous with what an insolent air she had almost ordered her from her sight and yet and yet she can remember that disdainful face kind and tender and loving 
a face she had once delighted to dwell upon, and Isabel had been very good to her once, when others had not been kind, and when Swanston, her natural protector, had been scandalously untrue to his trust. Isabel had loved her then, and now how was she about to requite her? Was she to let her know her to be false? not only in thought but in reality could she live and see that pale face in imagination filled with scorn for the desecrated friendship that once had been a real bond between them oh a groan that is almost a sob breaks from her the scale has gone down to one side it is all over hope and love and joy isabel has won she has been leaning against the arm of the lounge. Now she once more sinks back upon the seat, as though standing is impossible to her. Well, says Baltimore, laying his hand gently upon hers. His touch seems to burn her. She flings his hand from her and shrinks back. You have decided, says he quickly. You will not come with me oh no 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 cries she it is impossible a little curious laugh breaks from her that is cruelly akin to a cry there is too much to remember says she suddenly you think you would be wronging her says baltimore reading her correctly i have told you you are at fault there she would bless the chance that swept me out of her life and as for me i should have no regrets you need not fear that ah that is what i do fear says she in a low tone well you have decided says he after a pause after all why should i feel either disappointment or surprise what is there about me that should tempt any woman to cast in her lot with mine much says lady swanston deliberately but the one great essential is wanting you have no love to give it is all given she leans toward him and regards him earnestly do you really think you are in love with me shall i tell you who you are in love with she lets her soft cheek fall into her hand and looks up at him from under her long lashes you can tell me what you will says he a little impatiently listen then says she with a rather broken attempt at gaiety you are in love with that good charming irritating impossible but most lovable person in the world your own wife pshaw says baltimore with an irritated gesture we will not discuss her if you please as you will to discuss her or leave her name out of it altogether will not however alter matters you have quite made up your mind says he presently looking at her searchingly you will let me go alone into evil you will not go returns she trying to speak with conviction but looking very anxious i certainly shall there is nothing else left for me to do life here is intolerable there is one thing says she her voice trembling you might make it up with her do you think i haven't tried says he with a harsh laugh i'm tired of making advances I have done all that a man can do. No, I shall not try again. My one regret in leaving England will be that I shall not see you again. Don't, says she hoarsely. I believe on my soul, says he hurriedly, that you do care for me, that it is only because of her that you will not listen to me. You are right, in a low tone. I her voice fails her she presses her hands together confess says she with a terrible abandonment 
that i might have listened to you had i not liked her so well better than me apparently says he bitterly she has had the best of it all though we are quits then says she quite as bitterly because you like her better than me if so do you think i would speak to you as i have spoken yes i think that a man is always more or less of a baby years of discretion he seldom reaches you are angry with your wife and would be revenged upon her and your way to revenge yourself is to make a second woman hate you a second i should probably hate you in six months says she with a touch of passion i am not sure that i do not hate you now her nerve is fast failing her if she had a doubt about it before the certainty now that baltimore's feeling for her is merely friendship the desire of a lonely man for some sympathetic companion anything but love has entered into her and crushed her he would devote the rest of his life to her she is sure of that but always it would be a life filled with an unavailing regret a horror of the whole situation has seized upon her she will never be any more to him than a pleasant memory while he to her must be an ever-growing pain oh to be able to wrench herself free to be able to forget him to blot him out of her mind for ever a second woman repeats he as if struck by this thought to the exclusion of all others yes you think then gazing at her that she hates me lady swanston breaks into a low but mirthless laugh the most poignant anguish rings through it she she cries she as if unable to control herself and then stops suddenly placing her hand to her forehead oh no she doesn't hate you says she but how you betray yourself do you wonder i laugh did ever any man so give himself away you have been declaring to me for months that she hates you yet when i put it into words or you think i do seems as though some fresh new evil had befallen you ah give up this role of don juan baltimore it doesn't suit you i have had no desire to play the part says he with a frown no and yet you ask a woman for whom you scarcely bear a passing affection to run away with you to defy public opinion for your sake and so forth you should advise her to count the world well lost for love such love as yours you pour every bit of the old rubbish into one's ears and yet she stops abruptly a very storm of anger and grief and despair is shaking her to her heart's core well says he still frowning what have you to offer me in exchange for all you ask me to give a heart filled with thoughts of another no more if you persist in thinking why should i not think it when i tell you there is danger of me hating you as your wife might perhaps hate you your first thought is for her you think then that she hates me she imitates the anxiety of his tone with angry truthfulness not one word of horror at the thought that i might hate you six months hence perhaps i did not believe you would says he with some embarrassment ah that is so like a man you think don't you that you were made to be loved there go leave me he would have spoken to her again but she rejects the idea with such bitterness that he is necessarily silent 
she has covered her face with her hands presently she is alone end of chapter 46 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter number 47 of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter 47 but there are griefs, a griefs as deep, the friendship turned to hate, and deeper still, and deeper still, repentance come too late, too late. Joyce, on the whole, had not enjoyed last night's dance at the court. Barbara had been there, and she had gone home with her and Monkton after it, and on waking this morning, a sense of unreality of dissatisfaction is all that comes to her no pleasant flavor is on her mental palate there is only a vague feeling of failure and a dislike to looking into things to analyze matters as they stand yet where the failure came in she would have found it difficult to explain even to herself everybody so far as she was concerned had behaved perfectly that is as she if she had been compelled to say it out loud would have desired them to behave mr beauclerk had been polite enough not too polite and lady baltimore had made a great deal of her and barbara had said she looked lovely and freddie had said something oh absurd of course and not worth repeating but still flattering and those men from the barracks at clonby had been a perfect nuisance they were so pressing with their horrid attentions and so eager to get a dance and mr dysart well that fault could not be laid to his charge therefore of course he was all that could be desired he was circumspect to the last degree he had not been pressing with his attentions he had indeed been so kind and nice that he had only asked her for one dance and during the short quarter of an hour that took to get through he had been so admirably conducted as to restrain his conversation to the most commonplace and had not suggested that the conservatory was a capital place to get cool in between the dances the comb she was doing her hair with at the time caught in her hair as she came to this point and she flung it angrily from her she and assured herself that the tears that had suddenly come into her eyes arose from the pain that that hateful instrument of torture had caused her yes felix had taken the right course he had at least learned that she could never be anything to him could never forgive him it showed great dignity in him great strength of mind she had told him at least given him to understand when in london that he should forget her and he had forgotten he had obeyed her the comb must have hurt her again and worse this time because now the tears are running down her cheeks how horrible it is to be unforgiving people who don't forgive never go to heaven there seems to be some sort of vicious consolation in this thought in truth dysart's behavior to her since his return has been all she had led him to understand it ought to be he it so changed toward her in every way that sometimes she has wondered if he has forgotten all the strange 
unhappy past and now entirely emancipated from the torture of love unrequited that once had been his it is a train of thought she has up to this shrank from pursuing yet which she being strong in certain ways should have been pursued by her to the bitter end one small fact however has rendered her doubtful she could not fail to notice that whenever he and she are together in the morning-room ball-room or at luncheon or dinner or breakfast though he will not approach or voluntarily address her until she first makes an advance toward him a rare occurrence still if she raises her eyes to his anywhere at any moment it is to find his on her and what sad eyes searching longing despairing angry but always full of an indescribable tenderness last night she had specially noticed this but then last night he had specially held aloof from her no no it was no use dwelling upon it he would not forgive that chapter in her life was closed to attempt to open it again would be to court defeat joyce however had not been the only one to whom last night had been a disappointment beauclerk's determination to propose to her to put his fortune to the touch and to gain hers failed either the fates were against him or else she herself was in a wilful mood she had refused to leave the dancing-room with him on any pretext whatever unless to gain the coolness of the crowded hall outside or the still more inhabited supper-room he was not dismayed however and there was no need to do things precipitately there was plenty of time there could be no doubt about the fact that she preferred him to any of the other men of her acquaintance he had discovered that she had refused dysart not only once but twice this he had drawn out of isabel by a mild and apparently meaningless but nevertheless incessant and abstruse cross-examination naturally he could see at once the reasons for that no girl who had been once honored by his attentions could possibly give her heart to another no girl ever yet refused an honest offer unless her mind was filled with the image of another fellow mr beauclerk found no difficulty about placing the other fellow in this case norman beauclerk was his name what woman in her senses would prefer that tiresome dysart with his downright honesty business so gloomily developed to him beauclerk answer no one well she shall be rewarded now dear little girl he will make her happy for life by laying his name and prospective fortune at her feet to-day he will end his happy bachelor state and sacrifice himself on the altar of love thus resolved he walks through the lands of the court through the valley filled with opening fronds of ferns and through the spinney beyond that again until he comes to where the monktons live the house seems very silent knocking at the door the maid comes to tell him that mr and mrs monkton and the children are out but that miss kavanagh is within happy circumstance surely the fates favor him they always have by the by sure sign that he is deserving of good luck thanks miss kavanagh then his compliments and hopes that she is not too fatigued to receive him the maid having shown him into the drawing-room retires with the message and presently the sound of little high-heeled shoes crossing the hall tells him that joyce is approaching his heart beats high not immortally high 
to be uncertain is to be none of the less unnerved but there is no uncertainty about his wooing still it pleases him to know that in spite of her fatigue she could not bring herself to deny herself to him ah how good of you says he as she enters meeting her with both hands outstretched i feared the visit was too early a very betise on my part but you are the soul of kindness always early says joyce with a little laugh why you might have found me chasing the children round the garden three hours ago providently giving him one hand the ordinary one and ignoring his other their father and mother were bound to go to tisdown this morning or i should have been dead long before this ah said beauclerk and then with increasing tenderness so glad they were removed it would have been too much for you wouldn't it yes i dare say on the whole i believe i don't mind them said miss kavanagh well and what about last night it was delightful wasn't it secretly she sighs heavily as she makes this most untruthful assertion ah was it asked he i did not find it so how could i when you were so unkind to me i oh no oh surely not says she anxiously there is no touch of the coquetry that might be about this answer had it been given to a man better liked a slow soft color has crept into her cheeks born of the knowledge that she had got out of several dances with him but he seeing it gives it another a more flattering meaning to his own self-love can you deny it asks he changing his seat as to get nearer to her joyce he leans towards her may i speak at last last night i was foiled in my purpose it is difficult to say all that is in one's heart at a public affair of that kind but now now miss kavanagh has sprung to her feet no don't don't she says earnestly i tell you i beg you i warn you she pauses as if not knowing what else to say and raises her pretty hands as if to enforce her words shy delightfully shy says beauclerk to himself he goes quickly up to her with all the noble air of the conqueror and seizing one of her trembling hands holds it in his own hear me he says with an amused toleration for her girlish mauvais haunt it is only such a little thing i have to say to you but yet it means a great deal to me and to you i hope i love you joyce i have come here to-day to ask you to be my wife i told you not to speak says she she has grown very white now i warned you it is no use no use indeed i have startled you says beauclerk still disbelieving yet somehow loosening the clasp on her hand you did not expect perhaps that i should have spoken to-day and yet no it was not that said miss kavanagh slowly i knew you would speak i thought last night would have been the time but i managed to avoid it then and now well i thought it better to get it over says she gently she stops as if struck by something and heavy tears rush to her eyes ah she had told another very much the same as that but she had not meant it then and yet had been believed and now when she does mean it she is not believed oh if the cases might be reversed beauclerk however mistakes the cause of tears it get what over demands he smiling this misunderstanding 
ah yes that i am afraid he leans more closely toward her i have often been afraid that you have not quite read me as i ought to be read oh i have read you says she with a little gesture of her head half confused half mournful but not rightly perhaps there have been moments when i fear you might have misjudged me not one says she quickly mr beauclerk if i might implore you not to say another word only one more pleads he coming up smiling as usual just one joyce let me say my last word it may make all the difference in the world between you and me now i love you nay hear me she has risen and he rising too takes possession of both her hands i have come here to-day to ask you to be my wife you know that already but you do not know how i have worshipped you all these dreary months and how i have kept silent for your sake and for my sake why do you speak now asked she she has withdrawn her hands from his what have you to offer me now that you had not a year ago after all it is a great thing to be an accomplished liar it sticks to beauclerk now why haven't you heard asks he lifting astonished brows i have heard nothing not of my coming appointment at least modestly of my chance at it no nothing nothing and even if i had it would make no difference i beg you to understand once for all mr beauclerk that i cannot listen to you not now perhaps i have been very sudden no never never are you telling me that you refuse me asks he looking at her with a rather strange expression in his eyes i am sorry you put it that way returns she faintly i don't believe you know what you are doing cries he losing his self-control for once in his life you will regret this for a moment of spite of ill-temper you why should i be ill-tempered about anything that concerns you and me says she very gently still she has grown even whiter however and has lifted her head so that her large eyes are directed straight to his something in the calm severity of her look chills him ah you know best says he viciously the game is up is thoroughly played out this he acknowledges to himself and the knowledge does not help to sweeten his temper it helps him however to direct a last shaft at her taking up his hat he makes a movement to depart and then looks back at her his overweening vanity is still alive when you do regret it says he and i believe that will be soon it will be too late you had the goodness to give me a warning a few minutes ago i give you one now i shall not regret it says she coolly not even when dysart has sailed for india and then the girl he left behind him is disconsolate asks he with an insolent laugh ha huh, that touches you it had touched her she looks like a living thing stricken suddenly into marble as she stands gazing back at him with her hands tightly clenched before her india to india and she never had heard extreme anger however fights with her grief and overcoming it enables her to answer her adversary i think you too will feel regret says she gravely when you look back upon your conduct to me to-day there is such gentleness such dignity in her rebuke and her beautiful face is so full of mute reproach that all the good there is in beauclerk rises to the surface he flings his hat upon a table near 
and himself at her feet forgive me cries he in a stifled tone have mercy on me joyce i love you i swear it do not cast me adrift all i have said or done i regret now you said i should regret and i do something in his abasement disgusts the girl instead of creating pity in her breast she shakes herself free of him by a sharp and horrified movement you must go home she says calmly yet with a frowning brow and you must not come here again i told you it was all useless but you would not listen no no not a word he has risen to his feet and would have advanced toward her but she waves him from her with a sort of troubled hatred in her face you mean begins he hoarsely one thing one thing only feverishly that i hope i shall never see you again end of chapter forty seven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter forty eight of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford. Chapter forty eight when a man hath once forfeited the reputation of his sincerity he is set fast and nothing will then serve his turn neither truth nor falsehood when he is gone joyce draws a deep breath for a moment it seems to her that it is all over a disagreeable task performed and then suddenly a reaction sets in the scene gone through has tried her more than she knows, and without warning now she finds she is crying bitterly. How horrible it has all been! How detestable he had looked, not so much when offering her his hand, as for his heart, pa, as when he had given way to his weak exhibition of feeling and had knelt at her feet, throwing himself on her mercy she placed her hands over her eyes when she thought of that oh she wished he hadn't done it she is still crying softly not now for beauclerk's behavior but for certain past beliefs when a knock at the door warns her that another visitor is coming she has not had time or sufficient presence of mind to tell the servant that she is not at home when Miss Maliphant is ushered in by the parlour-maid. "'I thought I'd come down and have a chat with you about last night,' she begins in her usual loud tones, with an assumption of easiness that belied by the keen and searching glance she directs at Joyce. "'I'm so glad,' says Joyce, telling her little lie as bravely as she can, while trying to conceal her red eyelids from Miss Maliphant's astute gaze by pretending to rearrange a cushion that has fallen from one of the lounges. "'Are you?' says her visitor dryly. "'Seems to me I've come at the wrong moment. Shall I go away?' "'Go? No,' said Joyce, reddening and frowning a little. "'Why should you?' "'Well, you've been crying,' said Miss Maliphant in her terribly downright way i hate people when i've been crying but then it makes me a fright and it only makes you a little less pretty i suppose i mustn't ask what it is all about if you did i don't believe i could tell you says joyce laughing rather unsteadily i was merely thinking and it is the simplest thing in the world to feel silly now and then thinking of Mr. Beauclerk? asked Miss Maliphant promptly, and without the slightest idea of hesitation. I saw him leaving this as I came by the upper road. Was it he who made you cry? Certainly not, said Joyce indignantly. 
it looks like however says the other her masculine voice growing even sterner what was he saying to you i really do think joyce is beginning coldly when miss maliphant stops her by an imperative gesture oh i know i know all about that says she contemptuously one shouldn't ask questions about other people's affairs i've learned my manners though i seldom make any use of my knowledge i admit after all i see no reason why i shouldn't ask you that question i want to know and there is no one to tell me but you was he proposing to you eh why should you think that asked joyce subdued by the masterful manner of the other and by something honest and above board about her that is her chief characteristic there is no suspicion either about her of her questions being prompted by mere idle curiosity she has said she wants to know and there was meaning in her tone why shouldn't i says she now he came down here early this afternoon he goes away in haste and i find you in tears everything points one way i don't see why it should point in that direction come be open with me says the heiress brusquely in an abrupt fashion that still fails to offend did he propose to you joyce hesitates she raises her head and looks at miss maliphant earnestly what a good face she has if plain too good to be made unhappy after all why not tell her the truth it would be a warning it was impossible to be blind to the fact that miss maliphant had been glad to receive the dishonest attentions paid to her every now and then by beauclerk those attentions would probably be increased now and would end but one way he would get miss maliphant's money and she the good kind-hearted girl what would she get it seems cruel to be silent and yet to speak is difficult would it be fair or honorable to divulge his secret would it be fair or honorable to let her imagine what is not true he had been false to her joyce she could not blind herself to the knowledge that with all his afflicted desire for her he would never have made her an offer of his hand but for her having come in for that money he would therefore be false to miss maliphant he would marry her undoubtedly but as a husband he would break her heart is she for the sake of a word or two to see her fall a prey to a mere passionless fortune hunter a thousand times no better inflict a little pain now rather than let this girl endure endless pain in the future with a shrinking at her heart born of the fear that the word will be very bitter to her guest she says yes very distinctively ha says miss maliphant and that is all joyce regarding her anxiously is as relieved as astonished to see no trace of grief or chagrin upon her face there is no change at all indeed except she looks deeply reflective her mind seems to be traveling backward picking up loose threads of memory no doubt and joining them together a scene of intense comfort fills joyce's soul after all the wound has not gone deep she has been right to speak he is not worth thinking about says she tremendously apropos of nothing as it seems no said miss maliphant then what were you crying about i hardly know i feel nervous and once i did like him not very much but still i liked him and he was a disappointment tell you what said miss maliphant you've hit upon a big truth he is not worth thinking about once perhaps i too liked him and i was an idiot for my pains but i shan't like him again in a hurry 
I expect I've got to let him know that, one way or another, and as for you, I tell you I never liked him much, says Joyce, with a touch of displeasure. He was handsome, suave, agreeable, but he was and he is a hypocrite, interrupts Miss Maliphant, with truly beautiful conciseness. She has never learned to mince matters. And when all is told, perhaps nothing better than a fool, you are well out of it, in my opinion. I don't think I had much to do with it, says Joyce, unable to refrain from a smile. I fancy my poor uncle was responsible for the honor done me to-day. Then a sort of vague feeling that she is being ungenerous distresses her. Perhaps, after all, I misjudge him too far, she says. Could you? with a bitter little laugh. I don't know. Doubtfully, one often forms an opinion of a person, and though the groundwork of it may be just, still one is too inclined to build upon it and to rear stories upon it that get a little beyond the actual truth when the structure is completed. Oh, I think it is he who tells all the stories, says Miss Maliphant who is singularly dull in little unnecessary ways, and has failed to follow Joyce in her upstairs flight. In my opinion, he's a liar. I was going to say pure as simple, but he is neither pure nor simple. A liar, says Joyce, as if shocked. Some old thought recurs to her. She turns quickly to Miss Maliphant. The thought grows into words almost before she is aware of it. "'Have you a cousin in India?' asks she. "'In India?' Miss Maliphant regards her with some surprise. "'Why this sudden absurd question is an interesting conversation about that, Judas? "'I regret to say this is what Miss Maliphant has now decided upon naming Mr. Beauclerk when talking to herself.' Yes, India. No one, plenty in Manchester and Birmingham, but no one in India. Joyce leans back in her chair, and strange laugh breaks out from her. She gets up suddenly and goes to the other and leans over her, as though the better to see her. Oh, think, think, says she. Not a cousin you loved, dearly loved, a cousin for whom you were breaking your heart who was not as steady as he ought to be, but who— You must be going out of your mind, said Miss Maliphant, drawing back from her. If you saw my Birmingham cousins, or even the Manchester ones, you wouldn't ask that question twice. They think of nothing but money, 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 from morning till night, and are essentially shoppy. I don't mind saying it you know, it is as good to give up and acknowledge things, and certainly they— Never mind, then. It is the Indian cousin in whom I am interested, says Joyce impatiently. You are sure, sure that you haven't one out there, one whom Mr. Beauclerk knew about, and who was in love with you and you with him, the cousin he told me of— Mr. Beauclerk? Yes, yes, the night of the ball at the court, last autumn. I saw you with Mr. Beauclerk in the garden then, and he told me afterward you had been confiding in him about your cousin, the one in India, that you were going to be married to him. Oh, there must be truth, some truth in it. Do try to think. If, says Miss Maliphant slowly, I were to think until I was black in the face, as black as any Indian of em all, I couldn't even by so severe a process conjure up a cousin in Hindostan. And so he told you that? Yes, says Joyce faintly. She feels almost physically ill. He's positively unique, said Miss Maliphant, after a slight pause. 
I told you just now that he was a liar, but I didn't throw sufficient enthusiasm into the assertion. He is a liar of distinction very far above his fellows. I suppose it would be superfluous now to ask if that night you speak of you were engaged to Mr. Dysart? Oh, no, says Joyce quickly, as if struck. There never has been, there never will ought of that sort between me and Mr. Dysart. Surely Mr. Beauclerk did not. Oh, yes, he did. He assured me, not in so many words, let me be perfectly just to him, but he positively gave me to understand that you were going to marry Felix Dysart. There, don't mind that, seeing the girl's pained face. He was bound to say something, you know, though it must be confessed the Indian cousin's story was the most ingenious. Why didn't you tell me of that before? Because he told it to me in the strictest confidence. Of course, bound you on your honor not to speak of it, lest my feelings should be hurt. Really, do you know, I think he was almost clever enough to make one sorry he didn't succeed. Well, good-bye. She rises abruptly, and taking Joyce's hand, looks at her for a moment. Felix Dysart has a good heart, says she suddenly. As suddenly she kisses Joyce, and crossing the room with a quick stride, leaves it. End of chapter 48 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 49 of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter 49 Shall we not laugh? Shall we not weep? It is quite four o'clock, and therefore two hours later. Barbara has returned, and has learned the secret of Joyce's pale looks and sad eyes, and is now standing on the hearthrug, looking as one might who has been suddenly wakened from a dream that had seemed only too real. Do you mean to say, you really mean, Joyce, that you refused him? Yes. I actually had that much common sense, with a laugh that has something of bitterness in it. But I thought, I was sure. I know you thought he was my ideal of all things admirable, and you thought wrong. But if not he, Barbara, says Joyce sharply, was it not enough that you should have made one mistake? Must you insist on making another? "'Well, never mind,' says Mrs. Monkton hastily. "'I'm glad I made that one, at all events, "'and I'm only sorry you have felt it your duty "'to make your pretty eyes wet about it. "'Good gracious, looking out of the window, "'who is coming now? "'Dickie Brown and Mr. Courtney and those detestable Blakes. "'Tommy,' turning sharply to her firstborn, "'if you and Mabel stay here, you must be good.' Do you hear now? Good. You are not to ask a single question or touch a thing in the room, and you are to keep Mabel quiet. I am not going to have Mrs. Blake go home and say you are the worst behaved children she ever met in her life. You will stay, Joyce? Anxiously to her sister. Oh, I suppose so. I couldn't leave you to endure their tender mercies alone. That's a darling girl. You know, I never can get on with that odious woman. Ah, how do you do, Mrs. Blake? How sweet of you to come after last night's fatigue. Well, I think a drive a capital thing after being up all night, says the newcomer, a fat, little, ill-natured woman, nestling herself into the coziest chair in the room. I hadn't quite meant to come here, but I met Mr. Brown and Mr. Courtenay, 
so i thought we might as well join forces and storm you in good earnest mr brown has just been telling me that lady swansdown left the court this morning got a telegram she said summoning her to gloucestershire never do believe in these sudden telegrams myself stayed rather long in that ante-room with lord baltimore last night didn't know she had been in any ante-room says mrs monkton coldly i dare say her mother-in-law is ill again she has always been attentive to her not on terms with her son you know so lady swansdown hopes by the attention you speak of to come in for the old lady's private fortune very considerable fortune i've heard who told you asked mr brown with a cruelly lively curiosity lady swansdown oh dear no pause dicky still looking expectant and mrs blake uncomfortable she is racking her brain to try and find some person who might have told her but her brain fails her the pause threatens to be ghastly when tommy comes to the rescue he has been told off as we know to keep mabel in a proper frame of mind but being in a militant mood has resented the task appointed him he has indeed so far given in to the powers that be that he has consented to accept a picture book and to show it to mabel who is looking at it with him lost in admiration of his remarkable powers of description each picture indeed is graphically explained by tommy at the top of his lungs and in extreme bad humour he is lying on the rug on his fat stomach and is becoming quite a martinet look at this he is saying now look do you hear oh i won't stay and keep you good any longer here's a picture about a boat that's going to be drowned down in the sea in one minute the name on it is reading laboriously all hands to the pump and with considerable vicious enjoyment it isn't a bit of good for them either here pointing to the picture again with a stout forefinger here they're all handsing at the pump see no i don't and i don't want to says mabel whimpering and hiding her eyes oh i don't like it it's a horrid picture what's that man doing there in the corner peeping through her fingers at a dead man in the foreground he's dead i know he is of course he is says tommy and valiantly i don't care a bit i don't oh but i do says mabel and there's a lot of water isn't there there always is in the sea says tommy they'll all be drowned i know they will says mabel pushing away the book oh i hate hansing turn over tommy do it's a nasty cruel wicked picture tommy don't frighten mabel says his mother anxiously i'm not frightening her i'm only keeping her quiet says tommy defiantly ha ha says mr courtenay vacuously how wonderfully unpleasant children can make themselves says mrs blake making herself wonderfully unpleasant on the spot your little boy so reminds me of my reginald he pulls his sister's hair merely for the fun of hearing her squeal tommy does not pull mabel's hair says barbara a little stiffly tommy come here to mr brown he wants to speak to you i want to know if you would like a cat says mr brown drawing tommy to him i don't want a cat like our cat says tommy promptly ours is so small and her tail is too thin lady baltimore has a nice cat with a tail like mamma's furry for her neck well that's the very sort of cat i can get you if you wish but is the cat as big as her tail asks tommy still careful not to commit himself well perhaps not quite says mr brown gravely must it be quite as big i hate small cats says tommy i want a big one i want pausing to find a suitable simile 
and happily remembering the kennel outside. A regular setter of a cat. Ah, says Mr. Brown, I expect I shall have to telegraph to India for a tiger for you. A real live tiger? asks Tommy, with distended eyes and a flutter of wild joy at his heart, the keener that some fear is mingled with it. A tiger that eats people up? A man-eater, says Mr. Brown solemnly. It would be the nearest approach I know to the animal you have described. As you won't have the cat that Lady Baltimore will give you, you must only try to put up with mine. Poor Lady Baltimore, lisps Mrs. Blake. What a great deal she has to endure. Oh, she's all right today, returns Mr. Brown cheerfully. Toothache any amount better this morning. Mrs. Blake laughs in a little mincing way. How droll you are, says she. Ah, if it were only toothache that was the matter, but... Silence very effective and a profound sigh. Toothache's good enough for me, says Dicky. I should never dream of asking for more. He glances here at Joyce and continues sotto voce. You look as if you had it. No, returns she innocently. Mine is neuralgia, a rather worse thing after all. Yes, you can get the tooth out, says he. Have you heard, asks Mrs. Blake, that Mr. Beclerk is going to marry that hideous Miss Maliphant? Horrid Manchester person, don't you know? Can't think what Lady Baltimore sees in her. With a giggle, her want of beauty. Got rather too much of pretty women, I should say. I'm really afraid, says Dicky, that somebody has been hoaxing you this time, Mrs. Blake, genially. I happen to know for a fact that Miss Maliphant is not going to marry Beauclerk. Indeed, snappishly. Ah, uh, well, really he is to be congratulated, I think. Perhaps, with a sharp glance at Joyce, I mistook the name of the young lady. I certainly heard he was going to be married. So am I, says Mr. Brown, some time or other. We are all going to get married one day or another. One day, indeed, is as good as another. You have set us such a capital example that we are safe to follow it. Mr. and Mrs. Blake, being a notoriously unhappy couple, the latter grows rather red here, and Joyce gives Dicky a reproachful glance, which he returns with one of the wildest bewilderment. What can she mean? Mr. Dysart will be a distinct loss when he goes to India, continues Mrs. Blake quickly. Won't be back for years, I hear, and leaving so soon, too. A disappointment, I'm told. Some obdurate fair one. Sort of chest affection, don't you know? Ha <laughs> ha! India's place for that sort of thing. Knock it out of him in no time. Thought he looked rather down in the mouth last night. Not up to much lately, it has struck me. Seen much of him this time, Miss Kavanagh? Yes, a good deal, says Joyce, who has, however, paled perceptibly. Thought him rather gone to seed, eh? Rather the worse for wear. I think him always very agreeable, says Joyce icily. A second most uncomfortable silence ensues. Barbara tries to get up a conversation with Mr. Courtney, but that person, never brilliant at any time, seems now stricken with dumbness. Into this awkward abyss, Mabel plunges this time. Evidently, she has been dwelling secretly on Tommy's comments on their own cat, and is therefore full of thought about that interesting animal. "'Our cat is going to have chickens,' says she, with all the air of one who is imparting exciting intelligence. This astounding piece of natural history is received with varied emotions by the listeners. Mr. Brown, however, is unfeignedly charmed with it and grows as enthusiastic about it as even Mabel can desire. "'You don't say so! When? Where?' demands he with breathless eagerness. 
don't know says mabel seriously last time twas in nurse's best bonnet but raising her sweet face to him she says she'll be blowed if she has them there this time mabel cries her mother crimson with mortification yes asked mabel sweetly but it is too much for every one even mrs blake gives way for once to honest mirth and under cover of the laughter rises and takes her departure rather glad of the excuse to get away she carries off mr courtenay dicky having lingered a little while to see that mabel isn't scolded goes too and barbara with a sense of relief turns to joyce you look so awfully tired says she why don't you go and lie down i thought on the contrary i should like to go out for a walk says joyce indifferently i confess my head is aching horribly and that woman only made me worse what a woman i wonder she told so many lies i wonder if if mr dysart is going to india supplies joyce calmly very likely why not most men in the army go to india true say mrs monkton with a sigh then in a low tone i shall be sorry for him why if he goes coldly it is by his own desire i see nothing to be sorry about oh i do says barbara and then well go out dearest the air will do you good end of chapter forty nine Chapter number fifty of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. April's Lady by Margaret Wolf Hungerford. Chapter fifty. Tis with our judgment as our watches none go just alike yet each believes his own lord baltimore had not spoken in a mere fit or peak when he told lady swansdown of his fixed intention of putting a term to his present life his last interview with his wife had quite decided him to throw up everything and seek forgetfulness in travel inclination had pointed toward such countries as africa or the northern parts of america as being a keen sportsman he believed there he might find an occupation that would distract his mind from the thoughts that now jarred upon him incessantly his asking lady swansdown to accompany him therefore had been a sudden determination to go on a lengthened shooting expedition by oneself is one thing to go with a woman delicately nurtured is another of course had she agreed to his proposal all his plans must necessarily have been altered and perhaps his second feeling after her refusal to go with them was one of unmistakable relief his proposal to her at least had been born of pique the next morning found him however still strong in his desire for change the desire was even so far stronger that he now burned to put it into execution to get away to some fresh new sphere of action and deliberately set himself to obliterate from his memory all past ties and recollections there was too perhaps a touch of revenge that bordered upon pleasure as he thought of what his wife would say when she heard of his decision she who shrank so delicately from gossip of all kinds could not fail to be distressed by news that must inevitably leave her and her private affairs open to public criticism though everybody was perpetually guessing about her domestic relations with her husband no one as a matter of fact knew except indeed two 
quite the real truth about them. This would effectually open the eyes of society and proclaim to everybody that, though she had refused to demand a separation, still she had been obliged to accept it. This would touch her. If in no other way could he get at her proud spirit, here now he would triumph. She had been anxious to get rid of him in a respectable way, of course, but death as usual had declined to step in when most wanted, and now, well, she must accept her release in however disreputable a guise it comes. It is just at the moment when Mrs. Blake is holding forth on Lady Baltimore's affairs to Mrs. Monkton that Baltimore enters the smaller drawing-room, where he knows he will be sure to meet his wife at this hour. It is far in the afternoon. Still the spring sunshine is streaming through the windows. Lady Baltimore, in a heavy tea-gown of pale green plush, is sitting by the fire reading a book, her little son upon the hearth rug beside her. The place is strewn with bricks, and the boy, as his father enters, looks up at him and calls to him eagerly to come and help him. At the sound of the child's quick, glad voice a pang contracts Baltimore's heart. The child, he had forgotten him. I can't make this castle, says Bertie, and mother isn't a bit of good. Hers always fall down. Come you and make me one. Not now, says Baltimore. Not today. Run away to your nurse. I want to speak to your mother. There is something abrupt and jerky in his manner, something strained, and with sufficient temper in it to make the child cease from entreaty. The very pain Baltimore is feeling has made his manner harsher to the child, yet as the latter passes him obediently, he seizes the small figure in his arms and presses him convulsively to his breast. Then, putting him down, he points silently but peremptorily to the door. Well, says Lady Baltimore, she has risen, startled by his abrupt entrance, his tone, and more than all, by the last brief but passionate burst of affection toward the child. You wish to speak to me again? There won't be many more opportunities, says he grimly. You may safely give me a few moments to-day. I bring you good news. I am going abroad, at once, forever. In spite of the self-control she has taught herself, Lady Baltimore's self-possession gives way. Her brain seems to reel. Instinctively she grasps hold of the back of a tall pre dieu next to her. Ha! Huh. I thought so. I have touched her at last through her pride, thinks Baltimore, watching her with a savage satisfaction, which, however, hurts him horribly. And after all, he was wrong, too. He had touched her, indeed, but it was her heart, not her pride, he had wounded. Abroad? echoes she faintly. Yes, why not? I am sick of this sort of life. I have decided on flinging it up. Since when have you come to this decision? asked she presently, having conquered her sudden weakness by a supreme effort. If you want day and date, I am afraid I shan't be able to supply you. It has been growing upon me for some time, the idea of it, I mean, and last night you brought it to perfection. I? Have you already forgotten all the complimentary speeches you made me? They, with a sardonic smile, are so sweet to me that I shall keep them ripe in my memory until death overtakes me. And after it, I think, you told me, among many other wifey things, if my mind does not deceive me, that you wished me well out of your life and Lady Swanston with me. That is a direct and mo most malicious misapplication of my words, says she emphatically. It is? I confess that was my reading of them. I accepted that version, and thinking to you, 
a good turn and relieve you both of your bet noir at once i proposed to lady swanston last night that she should accompany me upon my endless travels there is a long long pause during which lady baltimore's face seems to have grown into marble she takes a step forward now through the stern pallor of her skin her large eyes seem to gleam like fire how dare you she says in a voice very low but so intense that it rings through the room how dare you tell me of this are you lost to all shame you and she to go to go away together it is only what i have been anticipating for months i could see how it was with you but that you should have the insolence to stand before me she grows almost magnificent in her wrath and declare your infamy aloud such a thought was beyond me there was a time when i would have thought it beyond you was there says he he laughs aloud there 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 says she with a rather wild sort of sigh why should i waste a single emotion upon you let me take you calmly casually come come now it is the saddest thing in a world to see how she treads down the passionate most natural uprisings within her against the unjust of life make me at least au courant with your movements you and she will go where to the devil you thought didn't you says he well you would be disappointed as far as she is concerned i may be going it appears she doesn't think it worth while to accompany me there or anywhere else you mean that she refused to go with you in the very baldest language i assure you it left nothing to be desired believe me in the matter of lucidity no she would not go with me you see there is not only one but two women in the world who regard me as being utterly without charm i commiserate you says she with a bitter sneer if after all your attention to her your friend has proved faithless i don't waste your pity says he interrupting her rather rudely on the whole the decision of my friend as you call her was rather a relief to me than otherwise i felt my duty to deprive you of her society with an unpleasant laugh and so i asked her to come with me when she declined to accompany me she left me free to devote myself to sport ah you refuse to be corrupted says she contemptuously think what you will says he restrained himself with determination it doesn't matter in the least to me now your opinion i consider worthless because prejudiced as worthless as you consider me i came here simply to tell you of my determination to go abroad you have told me of that already lady swansdown having failed you may i ask with studied contempt who are you going to take with you now what do you mean says he wheeling round to her what do you mean by that by heavens laying his hands upon her shoulders and looking with fierce eyes into her pale face a man might well kill you and why demands she undauntedly you would have taken her you have confessed so much you have the coarse courage to put it in words if not her why with a shrug then another there think as you will says he releasing her roughly nothing i could say would convince or move you and yet i know it is no use but i am determined i will leave nothing unsaid i will give you no loophole i asked her to go with me in a moment of irritation of loneliness if you will it is hard for a man to be forever outside the pale of affection and i thought well it is a matter of what i thought 
I was wrong, it seems. As for caring for her, I cared so little that I now feel actually glad she had the sense to refuse my senseless proposal. She would have bored me, I think, and I should undoubtedly have bored her. The proposition was made to her in a moment of folly. Oh, folly? she says with a curious laugh. Well, give it another name you like. After all, in a low tone, you are right. It was not the word. If I had said despair, I should have been nearer the mark. There even might be another word, she said slowly. Even if there were, says he, the occasion for it is of your making. You have thrown me. You must be prepared, therefore, to accept the consequences. You have prepared me for anything, says she calmly, but with a bitter meaning. See here, says he furiously, there may be still be one thing left for you which i have not prepared you have just asked me who i was going to take with me when i leave this place forever shall i answer you something in this manner terrifies her she feels her face blanching words are denied her but she makes a faint movement to assent with her hand what is he going to say what if i should decide then on taking my son with me says he violently who is there to prevent me not you or another thus i could cut all ties and put you out of my life at once and forever he had certainly not calculated on the force of his words or his manner it had been a mere angry suggestion there was no crudity in baltimore's nature he had never once permitted himself to dwell upon the possibility of separating the boy from his mother such terrible revenge as that was beyond him his whole nature would have revolted against it he had spoken with passion urged by her contempt into a desire to show her where his power lay without any intention of actually using it he meant perhaps to weaken her intolerable defiance and show her where a hole in her armor lay he was not prepared for the effect of his words an ashen shade has overspread her face her expression has become ghostly as though her limbs have suddenly given way under her she falls against the mantelpiece and clings to it with trembling fingers her eyes wild and anguish seek his the child gasped she in a voice of mortal terror the child not the child o oh, baltimore you have taken all from me except that leave my child good heavens don't look at me like that exclaims he inexpressibly shocked this sudden and complete abandonment of herself to her fear has horrified him i never meant it i but suggested a possibility the child shall stay with you do you hear me isabel the child is yours when i go i go alone there is a moment's silence and then she bursts into tears it is a sharp reaction and it shakes her bodily and mentally a wild return of her love for him that first sweet and only love of her life returns to her born of intense gratitude but sadly slowly it dies away again it seems to her too late to dream of that again yet perhaps her tears have as much to do with that lost love as with her gratitude slowly her color returns she checks her sobs she raises her head and looks at him still with her handkerchief pressed to her tremulous lips it is a promise says she yes a promise you will not change again nervously you odd doubt to the last says he it is a promise from me to you and of course the word of such a reprobate 
as you consider me can scarcely be of any avail but you could not break this promise says she in a low voice and with a long long sigh what trust you place in me said he with an open sneer well so be it i give you home and child you give me not worth while going into the magnificence of your gifts is it i give you once a whole heart an unbroken faith says she and you took them back again child's play said he child's promises well if you will have it so you will have got a promise from me now and i think you might say thank you for it as children do i do thank you says she vehemently does not my whole manner speak for me once again her eyes filled with tears so much love for the child cries he in a stinging tone and not one thought for the father true your professions of love were light in thistledown there you are not worth a thought yourself expend any affection you have upon your son and forget me as soon as ever you can it will not take you long once i am out of your sight he strides towards the door and then looks back at her you understand about my going he says that it is decided i mean as you will says she her glance on the ground there is such a total lack of emotion in her whole air that it be suggested itself to an acute student of human nature that she is doing her very utmost to suppress even the smallest sign of it but alas baltimore is not that student be just says he sternly it is as you will not as i it is you who are driving me into exile he has turned his back and has his hand on the handle of the door in the act of opening it at this instant she makes a move toward him holding out her hands but as suddenly suppresses herself when he turns again to say a last word she is standing where he last saw her pale and impassive as a statue there will be some matters to arrange says he before my going i have telegraphed to hansard his lawyer he will be down in the morning there will be a few papers for you to sign to-morrow papers my will and your maintenance while i'm away and matters that will concern the child's future his future that means that in all probability when i have started i shall never see his face again or yours he opens the door abruptly and is gone end of chapter fifty recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c